Um, so this session is Lessons from the UK, New Models of Accelerating the Flow of Capital to Good. Uh, as you have read in your programme, the UK appears to have an innovative history um, of civil society uh, activity, uh, significant amount of government support, both financially and legislatively, legislatively um, and a pretty hefty level of engagement from the financial services sector, which has really placed the UK in many ways. It's, I think we all sort of uh, kowtow a little bit when we think it. Uh, uh, the centre of innovation in impact investing, or as us Brits like to say, social investment, don't you think? Um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot to learn from. There's a huge amount that can be pr improved, and there's a huge amount that can be avoided. Um, we'll look at some of this now with our panel, uh, who uh, will introduce themselves as we go. Um, the panel is going to be very short. Um, can I encourage folk right at the back, if you're going to ask questions or engage, to come down so we don't have to run up and down with the microphone all the time. Um, the panel's going to be short. We're going to keep to less than 50% of the time uh, actually presenting. We've got some slides. Um, and then really we want to turn this over to the audience and have an audience-led session for the second, at least the second half, ideally a, a fair bit more. So please get prepared with succinct comments and thoughtful questions. Um, without further ado, I will hand over to Joe Ludlow uh, from Nesta, who will present first. So hello everybody. Um, Nesta's the uh, UK's foundation for innovation and um, we work uh, both to support innovation in the UK to drive the economy but also social innovation to tackle big complex social problems that we face. Um, and what I'm going to try and do is, is say uh, two or three things that hopefully put impact investment and social innovation in, um, in the same room and uh, tell you why uh, both of those things are very important to us and something about some of our work that straddles both of those fields. Um, and the starting point, I guess, is um, this idea that we face some very uh, big, long-term, complex problems. Uh, they're uh, big for us in the UK, they're big for many of the um, uh, developed countries around the world. So the aging population, um, the need to help children and young people learn and progress into employment in a changing economy and one that's increasingly digital. Um, the need to use energy uh, and our resources more efficiently. And to address all of those problems in um, a time when our public finances are really in a bad state, but also recognize, that's the graph on the left-hand side, our, um, it's not very clear, is it, but um, uh, the, the uh, UK's um, uh, expenditure is the top line on the left-hand graph and it's uh, public sector revenue on uh, the bottom line. Um, so we've been running a deficit, a big deficit for a long time. But the graph on the right-hand side says actually um, the effect of uh, the demographic change and the aging population um, is going to negate lots of the savings that we think we're putting in place. So that for us creates a context where we've got big complicated problems um, uh, and not a lot of public money to address them, so we need some innovation. And the other thing that's uh, increasingly clear to us is that this old world where you know, the private sector did its thing and supplied things to citizens and the state uh, provided things that uh, the private sector didn't or that citizens couldn't buy individually, and the social sector just stepped in to mop up what the other two sectors weren't doing well, isn't really fit to innovate in the way we need it to, to address those problems. And, um, you know, that's also in a context of falling trust in political institutions, in financial institutions, in the media. So we need to think again. And um, what we see in our work at Nesta really is that lots of the innovation that appears to be interesting and effective in tackling these issues comes where uh, the worlds collide, where private enterprise and the social sector are working together, where citizens are engaged in designing and producing and investing in innovations, where the state is both uh, purchasing but also helping to design and also working with citizens to design solutions. And all I want to say is just 
talk you a few, two or three examples that, that really resonate for me from work that Nesta's doing. So uh, the first one that I'll talk through is abundance. That's, uh, if you go to abundancegeneration.com, you'll see that they've taken, they've created a new product that enables uh, everyday people like you, me, to invest in the financing of large scale renewables. Um, the ones that are on their doorstep. And what, they can, what you can do is uh, connect up your utility bill to their web platform. So as well as seeing how much energy is being generated by your investments, you can see how much energy you're consuming and, and get some sense of the connection between your wealth and your consumption. We Are Cosmo is a lovely story of uh, a charity that I knew uh, several years ago called Beat Bullying that worked uh, in schools to uh, tackle bullying by getting kids to peer mentor each other. And what they did was realize that they didn't have a scalable solution. But if they took it online and built a web platform, then their, uh, then their technology would make, um, uh, would be scalable. And um, we are Cosmos for a result of that. Um, so the final point I wanted to make is that um, these big problems are being addressed where the sectors are coming together and technology is often the thing that's underpinning it. And put all, putting all of that together is where we see there's an investment opportunity. Thank you. As I said, we're going to keep this short and sweet and open it up as quickly as possible. Martin. Martin from Social Finance. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, quick intros, social finance. Uh, we are one of the UK's leading financial intermediaries for the social investment sector. Uh, I'm the sales director, so I spend all my time talking to investors from the philanthropically minded trust and foundations, high net worths, right through to the purely commercially minded uh, uh, institutional pension funds and the like, and everybody in between trying to persuade them uh, that the impact investment market is something that they should get interested in. Uh, ben asked me to talk about uh, social impact bonds, which is probably um, one of the best known products that we've created to date. Um, he's got a great sense of humor. I'm supposed to explain this thing in three minutes. Um, can I have a quick show of hands if you've heard of or think you know a little bit about social impact bonds? Keep your hands up for me for a second, thank you, keep them up, and keep them up if you know a lot about social impact bonds, and take them down if you don't know very much. Okay, great, sorry, so I'm gonna bore four people in the room for the next three minutes. Uh, the rest of you will probably manage it in 90 seconds. Um, I'm going to explain it using an analogy, and the analogy is simply this. Everybody knows prevention is better than cure, or to put it another way, it's better to build a fence at the top of a cliff than to run an ambulance service at the bottom of the cliff for those who've fallen off. Problem is governments have to run ambulance services and those are expensive and the government would like to go and build some fences but it doesn't have the money. It can't take the risk of building the fence with the money that it should be spending on the ambulance service because if its fence doesn't work, it still needs to be running the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and as we all know, government actually are rather rubbish at building uh, fences because fences need to be tailored to individuals. It's just not what they're very good at. They're better at running a one-size-fits-all ambulance type service. So the problem is we don't get much in the way of prevention. However, the private sector, social enterprises, uh, charities, for-profits are very good at running interventional services tailored to individual needs, be that in prison reoffending, be that in drug and alcohol abuse, be that in whatever issue. So we said, well, why don't we raise private sector money to build the fence? If we build the fence and the fence is successful, the government needs to run less ambulances at the bottom of the cliff. If we know how much it costs the government to run an ambulance and we know how many less ambulances are needed because of our fence, we have saved the government and we've saved the taxpayer money. We could share that saving. That way the government takes no risk, it puts no money in, and it saves money only in the event that it runs less ambulances. The private sector takes all the risk, and if we've done the sums correctly and we manage to reduce the problem sufficiently, we can give them their money back through their share of the cost savings. 
And actually, if we keep going and we do more good, we save more money, we share more money, it means investors can actually get a healthy return and one can start to attract more and more investors. So that's what we did. This first scheme is at Peterborough Prison. Peterborough is about an hour north of London, moderate-sized city. We raised five million pounds, a kind of drop in the ocean really, but it's the first, uh, first scheme from private uh, trust and foundations and high net worth investors. That five million pounds will be spent over six years on 3,000 individuals who are leaving Peterborough Prison from short sentences, so less than one year sentences. They currently receive no probationary services, no help whatsoever. They just get dumped back out on the street where they will re-offend 60% of the time within one year, 80% within two years. That's the official statistics. They lie, they're too low. Um, most of them will re-offend multiple times and will end up back inside. So we've raised the money. We are purchasing services from a number of organizations, some of them listed there up on the screen, um, and they are providing help through things like housing, education, for helping them to find a job, making sure they get their benefits, mental health issues, uh, drugs and alcohol abuse issues. Most of the people who come out have all of those issues and more besides. We provide coordinated services to interact with those folks. We then measure how many times they reoffend for a year after release. Hopefully not at all, but even some reduction is a step in the right direction. We measure that against a national cohort that is 10 times bigger to give us a relative movement from the group that we work with versus what happens nationally. We have a contract with the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Justice will pay us based on the rates of reduction that we see happening. The project itself will take six years to deliver. It's an eight year timeline as far as investors are concerned. And the investors will, if we are successful and receive uh, a 10% reduction in reoffending, we'll get a 7.5% uh, annualized return. And if we outperform that, that return can actually go up into double digits, so about 13.5%. So it's quite attractive. That's about as quickly as I can explain that. If I lost any of you on the way, I apologize. Very quickly. Where are we now moving that? Well, what's happened as a result of that? The Ministry of Justice have just announced £20 million worth of funding, payment, uh, pay by results funding for more schemes of the same. Uh, the Department of Work and Pensions have announced a £30 million uh, set of funds. Half of that money's been uh, awarded already. The second half is currently uh, up for tender. And that's working uh, with uh, youth not in education, employment or training, NEETS as we neatly call them, haha. -ha. Um, that was a joke. Oh good, you're still there, excellent. Um, there's a five million pound scheme just been announced in central London looking at rough sleeping and there's a whole range of uh, schemes just about to be launched looking at vulnerable children, kids going into institutional care. I'm sure it's the same in Sweden as it is in the UK. If kids go into institutional care, their futures are basically ruined. So we're trying to keep them out of institutional care. I think the question that we will come to address later on in the, in, uh, in the Q&A session is uh, government innovation. Is this a big change or is government innovation just a complete oxymoron? I leave you to ponder that. Thank you, Martin. Jeff, click one slide on. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jeff Bernand. Uh, I work at uh, Social Investment Business and also Investing for Good. Um, the amount of money that actually gets invested across the social investment space in the UK is estimated about 170 odd million. Um, if you take out that which is asset backed, it's about 10 million. So it's pitifully small. So despite our reputation for being innovators, um, <clears throat> not much money yet moves across um, that divide. So the problem we uh, set out to address was the shortage of good quality investment propositions that would appeal and be recognizable to mainstream capital market investors. So this is the opposite end to the angel investment uh, market. And um, if we were gonna scale this thing, the product had to be very simple. So um, uh, a simple product is what we've developed. Um, it is nothing more, nothing less, than a medium term note program, commonplace in the corporate bond market. And the innovation such as it is, uh, is that um, it's being applied to the charitable sector who are increasingly having to be more sophisticated about the way they finance uh, themselves and the opportunities around government outsourcing of public service delivery, as Martin's just, uh, just commented on. 
So, um, <clears throat> uh, on the left-hand side here, we have a, a screen grab of Prospectus by Scope. Scope is a UK charity dealing with disability. Um, and on the right-hand side, we have its features. Um, 20 million pound program. It allows the charity to issue tranches of debt. Uh, the first tranche they've issued, um, which, and this bond will close at the end of May, two million pounds, three years, 2% per annum, small denominations going smaller for the retail investors in next issues, unsecured, unrestricted, and listed on an exchange. There's nothing terribly complicated about uh, any of this. Uh, our role here is to be the FSA, so the Financial Services um, Regulators Approved Arrangers for the program and also the placement agent. So we put the programs together and then we go and find the investors. Uh, in terms of pipeline for this product, um, behind the scope uh, charity we have charities in the um, inner city regeneration, drug rehabilitation, youth, maybe age, um, financial inclusion. So quite a big uh, pipeline beyond that. Uh, the ambition is to have a, a portfolio of non-correlated fixed income products uh, measured, assessed, whatever, on a, on a blended return basis and uh, placed with a variety of investors. Um, <clears throat> for the scope bond, the interesting thing for us has been that the investors have come from public foundations, private trusts, institutional fixed income managers and uh, high net worths. Um, so a, a, pretty, a pretty good good range. Our general experience has been that, um, um, <clears throat> well, let me be blunt, this product's been fantastic for flushing out who, who does the talking in this sector, who, who does the doing. Um, <clears throat> there is an inordinate amount of chat in this space, and as I said, not much money seems to move it across it. So, um, uh, we've spoken to about 130 different investors, and they do oscillate between um, uh, reticence around the mission, reticence around the yield, impact first, finance first, or whatever. But it's a great product for finding out exactly where the, <coughs> where the investment co committees are in their understanding of this, uh, of this product. <coughs> uh, one of the things we've learned was our prospectus, which was put together by lawyers, which we're very grateful to, was quite dry in the articulation of the mission. So future, um, future bonds that we, we raise will be far more uh, telling the story around the impact. Um, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the way we measure our impact we're pretty comfortable with. Um, so I can talk a bit more about that later. But generally, uh, uh, although, although there's a lot of energy around impact, most investors are screened out for risk anyway in, into this space. So what they want to know is there's an impact measurement process that's going to repeat year on year and they can track the changes. Um, and just to maybe finish off quickly, um, uh, a couple of stories. Um, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the first was we, we spoke to a big uh, fixed income manager who sort of came into the room and uh, sort of sat down in his chair and went like this and I ran, he said, I run six billion fixed income uh, portfolios, you know, what can you tell me? <clears throat> and um, it wasn't until that we told him about the impact on the families that he, he, he really stood up and he basically said, you could, I'll buy everything you've got because I really, really want to play in this space. <clears throat> so that was great. And the flip side to that experience was talking to a private bank who said, Jeff, uh, look, you know, I love your product, it's fantastic, um, but I'm going to buy it in the secondary market. So I said, well, you know, why, why wouldn't you buy it in the primary market? <clears throat> And he said, because it's always going to go down in value. All the sellers will just drive the price down, and I'll pick it up when I, when I can pick it up at a cheaper level. And I said, well, what about the impact? And he said, well, I don't care about the impact. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, that's not why I'm doing it. So the lesson I've got from that is that um, as intermediaries in this process, we need to be able to be more determining around the price that these bonds get issued at and where they trade, because it will be a... Sh it will be a <coughs> um, Disaster, if you like, for the for the development of this market. If these become uh, too illiquid, junk bond status, and no one understands around the impact. So, controlling the price of impact um, is something we're working on uh, uh, at the moment. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, over to Arthur. Finally. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I have to admit I'm here through uh, through false pretenses, as Ben will tell you. I've only spent two years out of my eight years in this sector. See if I can get the technology to work. There we go. Uh, I've only spent two years out of my eight years actually in the UK. So I've got the accent, but I'm afraid I'm going to use some international examples as well. 
Um, we've been talking about money. We started off this morning talking about the cosmos, the universe, and large elephants. Uh, and we've ended up with at least two comments here saying there's not really that much money in the marketplace uh, and we should all be really quite worried. And let me tell you one of my dark secrets. I, I spent five years uh, as a US aerospace defense analyst. And why do I say that? Well, when I got up this morning, I was thinking, well, what am I going to say today? And it suddenly occurred to me that the total amount the United States spends on defense annually is roughly equivalent to the total endowment of US foundations. 98% of which is unaligned with social mission. And we give 5% of that away to the traditional $50 billion, which is that figure on the left-hand side. And about 98% of that is invested in the foundation model. And what is a foundation? It's a closed-end investment trust that gives 5% of its capital away for a tax break. And it's crystallized in the American tax system in 1921, and for all intents and purposes, it has not changed. So there is a trillion dollars worth of assets that is completely unaligned to social mission. And then there is another $55 billion where, for the most part, we have an unleveraged, unannuitized model where, if the blue tr blue tr blunt truth be told, the sector spends 50% of its time trying to raise money. And, and anybody in the social sector here that tells me that they get the vast majority of their money like that, um, I, I will buy them a very large gin and tonic. So we spend an awful lot of time trying to raise money. And the reality is, when you look at these sources of money, I won't run through them because I haven't time, but we look at it uh, really through the, the, these two sort of prisms, the, the not-for-profit side here on the left-hand side and the for-profit model there on the left-hand side. And then the money allocated through SR is very large. It's roughly $10 trillion. But the amount that actually goes to what we would call high net and high net impact, high net worth is about measured in the hundreds of millions in total. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that, ma that market is actually growing very fast, which suddenly explains why the private banks are, are suddenly interested in it. So those are the sources of money. The interesting thing, I would argue, is the trillion dollars that is in the foundation money. How do we get our paws on that? Social impact bonds that I had some involvement in their creation at the very beginning. If you think about, somebody mentioned the word resilience the other day. The problems we face with that 5% of that 98% we don't allocate, the problems we face in terms of externalities, uh, let me pick one, sanitation, $500 billion in terms of externalities, uh, road safety, another $500 billion, uh, climate, $4.3 trillion. These are huge sums of money, and if we can find ways of actually monetizing that market, then potentially there's a major opportunity. And I would argue that social impact bonds actually gives you the ability to do that. The other interesting capital market, I would argue, uh, is around local pension funds. In local markets, there is roughly $1.3 trillion worth of local currency in local markets. And if we can find mechanisms to leverage that capital, and we're working on a $400 million structure to do that at the moment, anybody's got a spare $25 million to close the deal, we'd be very interested. Um, and in essence, that allows you to leverage that capital uh, 15 times over a five-year period with IRRs of about 23%. And if this particular structure works, uh, it will be giving as much money as Gates does in about five years' time. So there's a whole range of financial innovation available in this market. But unfortunately, what happens in our discussion, we've moved on from, this community at least has moved on from the foundation world. We understand the opportunity of social investment. But where we've ended up in terms of this financial innovation uh, around capital market innovation is really within the context of a social venture capital, uh, social, social V model. And there's a whole bunch of these types of events you'll come to. And, and the basic premise of the argument goes, let's define it as social. We agree the metric. We'll have a legal structure called a BCOR. And hallelujah, the money will come. Now, I'm sure some money will come. But I'm not completely convinced uh, that it'll move in the scale we, we, we need it to. And in essence, what is being ignored in this debate, and if you think of this from a product mindset, what acumen was is the application of a fund management model to philanthropy. What structured social investment bonds are, and they're misnamed, is the application of structured investment product to this marketplace. What Lumini mentioned before is the application of an equity model uh, to education. What Willie Foote's model is in Photo Foot Capital is the factoring of um, a, a microfinance. These are all different models than a pure social venture capital model. And the nature of product development in a bank, and I've worked for 10 years in a bank on product development, is that all you're doing is changing cash flow to change the incentive. And the nature and change of those incentives means that we've got to begin to think about mechanisms that begin to create collaboration and begin to move scale. 
given the scale of the problems we face. And this debate's appeared in the last couple of years. We are moving away from the UN system that looks at this through an input model that's we each are 1% and we're hallelujah you are there, to how we think about a lot in this sector, which is how we bilaterally negotiate to capital towards outcome models. So how many prisoners reinfend? What is actually the pollution in, in this river? Those sorts of questions. And frankly, it's what we should care about. And once you begin to pay around outcome, not output, you begin to create collaborative structures. Uh, to do that, you need to have intermediaries, social finance, what Jeff is doing, what I partly do, what Willie Foote does, range of these places, are these new intermediaries in the marketplace. Intermediaries that recognize that blending the expertise of civil society, blending government capital, blending capital market instruments is key. There are new types of instruments other than the traditional foundation, which is, as I say, is based on, on, uh, on a model in 1903. So new intermediaries are absolutely key. Uh, legal structures, absolutely key. We can talk about blue in the face, about collaboration and working together, etc., etc. But unless you have a mechanism that allows you to engage the for-profit, not-for-profit and governmental sector within the same framework, each taking a different or indeed differing economic social return over a product life cycle, we are singing in the wind. So writing those rules, changing the fundamental paradigm of for-profit, not-for-profit, to create a mechanism that allows you to have different players taking different economic social return, because at the end of the day, all social finance structures are in essence cross-subsidization structures. And if you're looking for a cross-subsidization from the corporate sector, it better be on your terms, and it better have the social mission hardwired in. Entrepreneurship, I work for Shoka, and this is where I came across Ben's lovely red shoes that he likes wearing. Um, is about uh, Ashoka, uh, Acumen, uh, Schwab Foundation. There are a range of these players. Social entrepreneurship, as we all know, in, unlimited in the UK. Let's give a UK example. Uh, unlimited in the UK is about the R&D of society, these new ideas that are bubbling from the bottom up and being linked into the broader, broader system. And then the final part of the picture, which again you've seen develop over the last few years, is that essentially distribution. Grameen, and this is where we can actually learn something from, from the Far East. Grameen, BRAC, uh, the Aga Khan Foundation, these are organizations that have been around in many cases for, for hundreds of years and actually understand and come from those societies. And you are seeing them moving, beginning to think about from being a single product to actually a major distribution mechanism for, for social services. I'll give you the UK example, the Anglican Church, which is just beginning to think about this. So those are, when married to the corporate sector, have an ability to deliver social goods at very low, low cost and is an opportunity for the corporate sector in terms of engaging. Let me just give you a very quick opportunity. And you're probably thinking, you know, what on earth is this guy talking about? <laughs> there are already models that, that actually fit within this process, which is where, as a society, we have collaborated across the sector. The Garvey deal, $3 billion deal, essentially took the IFF, as it's also known, took future government cash flows, spent out to 2030, brought them all forward, empowered the citizen sector to negotiate with the corporate sector that dropped injections for the developing world from $50 down to five. It is all about collaboration and scale. The Community Reinvestment Act, a limited liability company structure um, with foundations taking the first loss, incentivized by a government tax incentive to bring private capital in. Huge provision of affordable housing in the United States. And what is more, critically, monitored by the Congressional Budget Office for the last 10 years, that tells you it is revenue neutral to revenue positive. Now, if you then marry that to a social impact bond, that is revenue positive by definition. That is the language that government needs to hear. Language Government needs to hear that what we are proposing as a sector can move in scale and can actually potentially be revenue neutral. So those are existing models that already exist. But let me give you, you can take that even further. The type of collaboration that, that, that I just mentioned, where you're using social impact bonds based on the, the outcome that's created. If you then securitize that cash flow, you essentially have a liquid vehicle that could be traded on a social stock exchange. If you have an OPIC guarantee, you can do it internationally. You could franchise it, again, by another so it contingent model, uh, delivered by civil society that is ethical, such as the organizations I, I mentioned. And let me give you a final what if. How about if you married that contingent return based on the tangible outcome to that other structure I mentioned, a guarantee structure, so that in local societies, you're actually incentivizing those local elites to deliver social goods to their own population in their own currency. Imagine how that revolutionary that could be.
Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Arthur. Um, questions? Hands? Before we get into discussion, um, I just want to throw one idea up, which, um, well, it strikes me, Arthur, Jeff, that there is actually no such thing as innovation in financial services in impact investing. So the title, we got the title of the, uh, the session wrong, didn't we? Grab a, grab a mic, I'm gonna keep hold of that one. Well, I think the innovation is where the, where the, where the price is for the, for the yield to the investor. So we could place our bonds, uh, our 2% yielding bonds, if they were yielding three or 4% with any, num any kind of investors. So the, 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 the challenge of this is you've got a perfect good structure, great credit risk, et cetera, et cetera. Where, where, do, you, um, where do you place those at? And the first comment that comes back from the institutional guys is, if you're asking me to take a sub-financial rate of return, how are you pricing impact? So the innovation then starts to come through around, around that. So when we deal with, with market makers and brokers who need to make, make a price, how, they, how they're determining what that price is is where the innovation comes through. So you might think it's impossible, but I think my example would be in brand, uh, brand development. 20 years ago, brands weren't valued in accountancy terms. Now they are. So there is the opportunity uh, to start working on the fact that we will end up with a more quantifiable metric around, around impact. And that's, that, to me, is almost the most exciting part of all of this, is, is, uh, is where, does that, where does that sit? Everything else pretty much uh, is fairly straightforward. The other innovation is, uh, the other, slightly, slightly cynically, I can say there's two problems in the world. One is global poverty, and the other one is converting the wealth manager and financial advisor to this market, which, uh, <laughs> which is a challenge in its own, uh, its own way. But, but, I mean, I would say, Martin, actually, there's, a, there's an issue around uh, SIBs of social impact bonds are considered a financial innovation, but they're not really, are they? I, mean, I think Joe sort of posited the term a little while ago that it's an, it's an innovation in commissioning, not an innovation in financial services. Well, I mean, um, <coughs> I think it was Ecclesiastes says there's, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, so, you know, you could go back several thousand years of wisdom. Um, at the end of the day, all, all of these financial products are ultimately, um, you know, moving the risk and the reward process around. And it's a transfer from, in this case, what the risk that government used to take or maybe didn't. Um, I'm, I'm paying for that according to the risk that somebody else has, has taken on for themselves. Um, it is ultimately coming through as a change in the commissioning process, undoubtedly. And what we're, what we're seeing is, uh, in many ways, the private sector providers of many of these services changing the way they commission. So I think one of the big challenges for us in uh, social impact bonds in the UK is are we really going to create a new framework, a new paradigm, if I can nick that word from this morning, where... <clears throat> excuse me, where um, social enterprises, NGOs can play on an even field. Um, what we're, we're seeing is just the private sector providers are adjusting and saying, okay, well, the, the rules of the game have changed. We'll, we'll come along. We would be very foolish to expect them to not do that. And as shareholder-owned companies, they have to do that. That's what they're intended for. So I think that one needs to make sure that you keep a very open mind and don't just assume that because we're doing something that's got a social motive, it's necessarily going to revolutionize the way the world works. Arthur, we, uh, we heard about government innovation as an oxymoron. <laughs> Financial services innovation as an oxymoron. There is, I mean, there is nothing new under the sun at the end of the day. I mean, if, if you go back to October the 13th, 1307, prior to that date, we had a civil society banking system. I'll chat to anybody who was interested in history this later. So th there is nothing new in some senses. All product development in banks is moving cash flow backwards, forwards and sideways uh, to change the incentive structure. All social finance, I'm sure we all go to lots of events on social finance, and the academics love this. I mean, the conversation goes on for hours. The reality is, it's very simple. All we are doing is injecting modern capital market techniques into the provision of social goods. We are moving on from a single product market, the foundation system. The, the, the debate has moved to some extent to social venture capital. And now what you're seeing is a whole other range of these models which in the case of social impact bonds is essentially the application of multi-stakeholder um, models where something which is totally counterintuitive to most people in the not-for-profit world, the greater social impact you create, the higher the economic return. 
That seems totally counterintuitive, but that's the reality. And you marry it to a legal structure, you can, in essence, create quasi-equity. So, you know, there is nothing new here at the end of the day, but what is required is a change of mindset and a real change, change of mindset from our community ourselves. And that's the challenge I throw. If I go to another event where I hear somebody say, well, the bankers are going to invest in this sector. Well, if our own sector has 98% of its assets in one financial product, why do you expect a banker in, 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 in London to do this? It's bloody hard, as you and I know. Yeah. Uh, so there, there needs to be more, I've, you know, we need to move from rhetoric, and I hear a lot of it, to actual use and think about how these models can be applied in scale. And it is nothing new. It is just the application of what bankers in the city of London know uh, and is their normal grist to the mill. Nothing new under the sun. So we'll open up to the floor. First question. Can you uh, say who you are and where you're from? Gentlemen, thank you very much for the discourse. Um, James Molini, I'm an entrepreneur. And uh, I don't have a background in finance, but um, just out of curiosity, I'm wondering what your high-level thoughts were on uh, uh, social impact stock exchanges, such as the uh, impact investment exchange in Asia and what, what those models mean. Uh, thank you. For, uh, for the space as a whole. Who wants to take that on? I, I can say very quickly, in exchange, you have to have something to trade. Um, and it, it, you know, if you work in the markets, you realize you can trade down Bloomberg, you can ring an exchange up, there's a number of ways of creating that exchange. So the exchanges, and there's a, seven of them that I'm aware of, at the end of the day, there has to be some element of value. I would argue potentially social impact bonds provide that because there's a cash flow tied to the achievement of the social metric. Um, so yes, I think in terms of transparency and how you see those models, they will be very interesting. But uh, you know, the, the nature of an exchange is fine, but you know, what are you trading on that exchange is, is the question. Just pick up on, I mean, transparency is the key word. One of the biggest problems with this market at the moment is that those who need the capital can't find those who want to put the capital to work. I think what an exchange does, particularly one labelled as a social exchange, is it creates an environment where people can come together, where the rules of the game are understood. Um, I love the concept that you come in under a gate that says this is social investment. That's why you're here. That's why you're in this part of the market. So I think in principle, they're a great idea. I think they're necessary. They're an important part of the furniture to get this marketplace up and running. But I think the point that Arthur makes is absolutely right. This is very early stage. There isn't enough product at the moment to make a, a fully functioning exchange. Yeah, the bonds we're involved with are listed on Euro MTF, uh, uh, but the subsequent ones will, will dual list on a social exchange, providing that exchange can demonstrate that it's, it's properly valuing the, the price um, models around. Uh, if it's not doing that, then we don't need to list on that exchange. I mean, it's quite, it's quite, sorry, Joe. So about 18 months ago, I was involved in a research project that Ipsos Mori did with a foundation called Fair Banking for us. And um, I got to sit on the, on the see-through side of a one-way mirror looking in on a focus group with high net worth individuals who'd never come across social investment products before. And um, two insights. Um, one, it's amazing how many very rich people will come along for 100 pounds and sit in a room for three hours. Um, but the second more profound insight is that if you lock people in a room for three hours and go through painstakingly what social investment products are, they might begin to like them. But marketing doesn't work that way. You don't have three hours with people. And um, you know, we've got to find a way of communicating this world um, in short, clear, understandable ways. If a social stock exchange or so similar does that, then great. But there's a number of other ways. But we've got to get out of the kind of lab and start talking in the language of marketing. Can I add to that, because it's a very important point you've raised. One of the problems in the sector is that issue by issue, product by product, we put very complex structures together. I mean, as, as, as Richard will tell you, uh, sorry, Martin will tell you, uh, the social impact bond in the UK cost in pro bono roughly $450,000 to put it together. So we do issue by issue, product by product, uh, these very complex structures. And the nature of the cost structure is that it wipes out replication to, to a large extent, and it makes it very difficult. It's a huge barrier to entry to, to scaling that, that innovation. What I think you will see happen, and, and it's based around a number of structures that, that people are playing with at the moment, is you'll begin to see security structures that begin to um, essentially make that 
easy and accessible. And until you can drive those co costs down, if we want to engage the banks, for example, they have to be able to put it on their system, they have to be able to manage it in risk terms, and they have to be able to sell it to their salesmen, their sales organisations at the day. And when you take any of these ideas to bankers and try to pitch them, they look at them and they think, small, okay, horrific. Uh, parts of the world I can't get a decent lunch in. Um, horrendous in terms of due diligence. It, it has everything a banker dislikes. So until we can get to a situation of actually securitizing, I mean, I mean that in the broad sense of the word, in a sense that these structures become large scale and replicable and transparent, then you won't see the banks involved. And that, I think, is when the, the role of the social stock exchange uh, begins to come to play in terms of you're trading on this market and there are a series of moral values or social values that are tied to it. But it's, it's, it's early days, really, isn't it? I mean, so exchanges started a few hundred years ago in coffee shops with people realizing that they were losing one in three boats going around to India to pick up spices and the, other such. The, there's no secondary market. You know, effectively, there's no... If you speak to investor often. now, where's he going to exit? <laughs> um, then, you know, me and Arthur would share a bunch of boats and we realized we were better off. And then somebody would be overhearing in the coffee shop and they'd come in. But they'd come in at a, at a rate that was slightly better for myself and Arthur. So Joe and Martin come in and suddenly we have a private placement structure. And then we're sitting there celebrating six months later and, uh, and effectively you've got a, a secondary market. Um, and it's only going through that almost organic process that you can get to a strong, arguably, a strong exchange mechanism. There are a few secondary market functions starting to develop in the UK. One of them is in the room, and I'm wondering if you might want to explain what's going on with shared impact, Paul? Great. Paul Chang from Shared Impact. So one of, one of the problems in the UK is the lack of a secondary market for debt instruments. Um, so the creation of that will be important for the transparency of the market. Um, transparency um, on funds and their track records and opening up the um, social investment to the retail investor. Um, a question to the, to the panel, um, th there is this tension around the long-term creation of social value and social innovation and investor desire to have an exit. Um, it's it's ha often hard to see what exits actually mean in the social sector. To, to what extent does the panel see that as a, as a fundamental problem in the development of the market? I'll just make a first observation on that, and hopefully my fellow panelists can come up with something more intelligent to say. Um, the, the point of exit is if you look at a purely commercial transaction, let's say you go and buy a, a share in BP or Shell or something, the point of, of secondary market liquidity is that you know that at some point in the future you want those few pounds back to go and buy something or do whatever with that money. You know that there's somebody there, there's an exchange, it, you will just be able to sell it. So that, that is your exit. The exit is just there so that you can realize those, that, that money of maybe a profit or a loss or maybe just a sideways move, but you can get your capital back and, and move on. The large company, BP or Shell, isn't concerned that because you want to exit, you know, not everybody's exited, all the equity hasn't gone, you've merely passed on the ownership because you now need that cash back to rework it. So I think, in a way, we, we have to be slightly careful. We, for some reason, when we start talking about social enterprise exit, we start almost thinking that it's like everybody's going to bail out and that entity doesn't now have a, 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 a finance base. If we were at the point where social impact markets and, and environmental impact markets were fully functioning, then all it would be was would be just the passing on of those assets to other people who wanted to invest at that point in time, if that makes sense. Anybody have anything better to say now? Our answer has been to avoid the question. Um, so we just have debt that matures and has a yield, uh, and um, we avoid it. Because that's, if we wait for a solution, we're never going to get the investors in. So um, um, it's not a very good answer, but it's where we are. It would be refinanced, but maybe not from equity. It may just be refinanced. Well, it's, uh, that fits in with the JP Morgan Acumen report that Kevin Jones mentioned this morning that basically says that there has to be a concession on equity coming into the market in the medium to a well, short, medium, and long term 
but there's less less of a pressure in terms of a concession on debt. So it's easier to go in on debt. Sorry. For, for, for our issuers, they are well able to take on debt, well able to repay it, and the reason they take it on is it's cheaper than, than bank finance, so they just re pay down other more expensive debt, and they're not in the equity uh, position at all, and may, and may never get to the equity position. Sure. Uh, coming up this slightly differently, if you look at the majority, if you think about public service delivery, certainly in the UK, the majority of outsourced public service delivery is not provided by social sector entities, it's provided by the private sector. Um, and I would argue that it's legitimate for a, an innovative social sector venture uh, to sell its IP, sell the business into a private sector organization if that transforms the way they're delivering service, that creates an exit for a social investor with the right parameters in place, I think it also has potential to scale up the impact. I'm going to talk to a slightly different position. There are a whole range of models in this marketplace uh, that, that can potentially make money and do make money from, uh, from carbon, a conversation I had last night. Uh, social impact bonds. If you securitize that nice government cash flow, you would have an instrument that would then trade as a function of the achievement of the social metric. That generates a secondary market. There are ways of doing this. It, 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 is, uh, it is perfectly feasible to do. The problem with our sector is that we're a bit myopic in terms of the VCP model and tend to think within that paradigm. And there is a lack of economy of scale in some of these new emerging, emerging, uh, emerging structures. And as anybody knows that's involved in the financial markets, the more assets under management you raise, the lower your unit management costs are, and the more sophisticated risk management tools you can put into place. The problem is we're asking for you know, 500,000, a million here or there. And the ability to put sophisticated financial engineering into it is actually quite difficult. And it's an issue of economy of scale. I would actually argue that you know, if you really want to move away from this single product market, I don't understand why more people aren't mad about the fact that 98% of, of our market isn't associated with, with investment. I, I really just don't grasp it. If you really wanted to change it, I would suggest that we put 20% of all foundation money into program-related investment by 2020. That would immediately inject $140 billion into, into social investment. And it would be revenue neutral to revenue positive to, to government. And that is demonstrable. I can point you to the CBO figures that, that would indicate that. Uh, and with interest rates at about 1% or 2% of the markets where they are, I suspect it wouldn't really have a major impact on the foundations. In fact, they might even make more money. God forbid that we actually do stuff in the social sector. God forbid, actually, that we have social impact bonds that we actually performed on and provide a higher uncorrelated return. This is an, this is an issue of political will. It is an issue of our own community seizing the initiative. And I would argue it's pretty essential they do. Because at the end of the day, where you have a capital market, where the cost of adding that capital is 50 cents on the dollar, the moment the bankers sniff that a $1.4 trillion market is fragmented and they can access that in an easy, replicable manner, they will be providing that cost of capital a damn sight cheaper than a foundation that has one product. OK. I'm going to. Uh, I've got four, now five questions lined up, so I'm going to ask the panel to tighten up and go... No? You sure you're done? Okay, so now I have to run right up to the top. If you, oh, brilliant, you're going to come down and meet me halfway. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bjorn Stenqvist. I work in the city of Malmö with something we call sustainable regeneration of the city's tower block areas. So I have a question whether you have experience from social impact investment in the housing sector. The background to that is that between 1965 and 75, Sweden built 650,000 apartments in multi-dwelling buildings, which puts us on a percentage of the total housing stock on the level of Poland and Bulgaria. And as in many other European cities, we have a high concentration of unemployment, poverty, uh, youth crime, etc. in these areas. And there is today very scarce financing. You could make some uh, return on energy investments, but that would probably only cover 20% of the total necessary investments, because these houses are more or less 
falling apart. And if you have 47 million of these apartments in Western Europe and 10 million in Eastern Europe, of course, can you in some way provide finance that would also change the social situation, create jobs, raise um, income levels in these areas? And could you create some kind of financial instrument around that challenge? Um, so a complete solution to housing and all associated problems in two minutes, Martin. Yeah, it's very easy. We've, we've done it already, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, very, very, very good question. Um, in terms of the housing, very quickly, in the UK, the problem we've now run into was historically the, the government would basically provide the equity for the build phase of social housing. Um, and then once you had the housing in place, you had uh, government income coming in, in in the form of housing allowance to the tenants, maybe partly owned or maybe in, entirely rented, then you had uh, a a funding stream that you could go to the bank, you could refinance that equity back out and you just got long-term bank financing. Of course, the problem you've now run into is twofold. One, the banks are a lot more reluctant to lend the money to a completed project. And more importantly, with all of the, uh, uh, the government cutbacks in the UK, the equity piece for the building of social, enterprise, uh, sorry, social housing has completely gone. So the market is almost ground to a complete halt what we need to be doing in the UK because what you're absolutely right if you give these people housing you give them an area that they can be proud to live in regeneration zones as they're, they're known in the UK um, many of the other good positive social issues follow the problem we've got at the moment is finding that equity to Arthur's point this is exactly the types of things that foundations who claim to be interested in social community cohesion and social growth they should be providing that type of capital using their endowments to make those types of equity investments. Yes, they're risky, but they're not that risky. Make that and then provide something that maybe they leave some equity and the rest can be refinanced through through bank debt. But that was a, that was a should. Are Good. There any it's not examples? happening it's at the not moment. Happening. There, there I'd love to see and we're trying, we as social finance are trying to work on it, but as of yet, we don't have a full I mean, solution. There, there is one, there is one nascent solution that I know Joe and also Paul Cheng on the front row have been involved in to a certain degree. Is it worth mentioning here or not? Oh, no. Right. Damn. So, uh, I just wonder whether this is the kind of thing where a local financial product works. Are there people in the local area who want to invest in housing in their own community? The, the, the two issues in philanthropy that are always very interesting, one which you can always raise funds for, one is children and the other is housing. Uh, there are lots of, of these types of models. I'm, I'm not going to go into them now, but happy to chat, chat to you later, certainly in the United States, uh, because housing obviously is an asset you, you've got there at the end of the day. Um, so I think there is some innovation and, and it's probably worth, worth a conversation. Okay, next question. Hello, uh, Rodolfo from Main Street Partners. Um, what I think the distribution is, uh, as in any industry, is very important also in the impact investing uh, social finance field. What do you guys think about um, the banking sector or the banks in general? Which uh, role should they play into this? Because uh, if we look at uh, money, if we look at um, traditional securities, we look at investments, well, they're mainly intermediated by banks, in some cases created by banks. So what do you think is the role that banks should play here? Uh, Arthur mentioned that actually when you talk to a banker, you try to convince him to sell a product like that, like a social bond or anything like that, they get crazy <laughs> because they don't, want, they don't understand it or maybe they don't like it or there's not enough money for the pocket. Um, so I've been a banker for 12 years and then I became a social broker, entrepreneur, whatever you want to call it. What do you think about it? So, and which will be the right the right distribution channel if the banks are not the right one? Okay, um, great question. Distribution is key for the growth of this market. Uh, we spent the last several years trying to get those intermediaries, those bankers, to engage in this product. Um, they are broadly useless. Uh, I think we know that, but it's depressingly um, they are depressingly useless. So I think uh, 
I'm just exploring ideas around online distribution. Uh, I think if the yields for the products are sub-financial rate of return, then we have to be smart around the way the distribution of product get, gets, 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 gets worked up. So just right now, we're just going through a model around, around uh, how that might work. Um, but I've, I've got, uh, yeah, we were set up. I used to work for, work for a Merrill Lynch and, and places like that, and, and uh, um, they are inordinately slow and difficult to deal with. Uh, because there isn't a convenient spreadsheet and there's not 10 years worth of historic, historic track record. So I'm completely on side with your question and, and um, uh, it's a key thing to, to get this distribution right because otherwise we won't get product out there, obviously. Um, I'm going to strike a slightly more optimistic note. I, I agree with, with Jeff at the moment that they're, they're fairly useless, but as, an, as another redeemed banker, I hope. Um, I Not yet, Martin. Damn it. Um, <laughs> I'm... I'm passionate to try and get to a point where we can use the distribution channels that they do have. Because when I look at it from a purely selfish point of view, what's the point of me hiring lots of people and creating uh, you know, a massive headcount within my own organization to be distributing when there are people sat around the city of London and, and all the financial centers around Europe and around the world whose day job is already to pick up the phone and talk to investors. If I had a 50 million pound six year bond double-A rated, um, paying gilts plus 250 basis points um, for a social housing type event or, or a, a, I don't know, even a, a well, social impact bond is probably a bad example, but say social housing. If I took that to a Merrill Lynch or a Morgan Stanley or whoever, they'd place it for me. But the point is we don't have the products at the moment sufficiently that we can take to them in a format they understand. Forget trying to persuade them to change and come in at this stage to Arthur's point earlier. That, that just ain't happening. We have to use them through the mechanisms that they understand or don't use them. Same for accessing retail. I'd, I'd love to see products getting out there so that we could go and do more than just cash ices in, in Triodos. They're brilliant and that's the first one, but you know, there's, we, we need to see loads of this stuff out there. Anybody here could walk into their high street branch and buy a product. The problem is the regulator in the F in Europe, it's USITS three regulations. That's lost half the audience. Um, you know, we don't have the underlying products and tools yet to be able to white label these things and sell them out through the high street banks of BMP, HSBC, or whoever. There's, there's an interesting analogy here, isn't there? That there's B BOP distribution of products of, of products has effectively failed because the same organisations that try to R and D cook stoves or lighting are also trying to distribute and everything's fallen flat on its face and there's frontier markets outside is one of the first outfits who are actually going we're not interested in the product development we're just doing distribution and they seem to be smashing straight through so is there something there about doing what we're good at and letting the banks get on with it but jeff you're saying they're all, all right rubbish. i could talk all day about this i mean uh, just two, two quick two quick points one is it is disappointing these guys these these banks haven't met us halfway on the structuring side because they are experts at structuring uh, and the second point is around uh the, again the price i don't trust frankly a secondary market banker to distribute impact product at the on the right basis so if we're going to see this market grow and stay true to what we're trying to deliver here then i think it's very important that we come up with our, our own distribution because otherwise it would be lost okay joe and then we're going to go to another question oh yeah you too and then so, uh, two quick <coughs> points firstly um we keep doing research it keeps showing that there is demand for the product so it's definitely a distribution uh, problem uh, but you can see people creating their own distribution solutions and and that's not just in the social investment space. Abundance being so an abundance example. Abundance is, is an example in the social and environmental space but Zopo as a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform is yep. another one. Good. When I joined Ashoka eight years ago my brief was to engage the major financial institutions in this space so I've been dealing with them for about eight years on this issue. There are You've got to first ask the question which bit of the bank? For the private bank the reason they're interested is this is the largest transfer of wealth ever in human history. Six, $41 trillion in the United States alone that will be transferred by 3% of the population that owns 60% of the assets. So for the private bankers, when people reach 55 and glimpse their own mortality, they rationalize their providers from 11 down to about three. And philanthropy has a very clear mindset element in terms of that intergenerational wealth transfer. That's the reason UBS is, is, in, the, is in this marketplace. 
Uh, you then got the asset managers, which are taking a look at SRI portfolios and see this is the fastest growing element of, element of portfolios. But bear in mind the asset managers are already taking 1% on the $1 trillion. So 20% of everything we give away already goes as fees to the bankers. And then you've got the investment bankers that see this as a transition in terms of new investment, investment banking models. And I've seen this time and time again, where you, know, you get the senior management to buy into it, and then there's this sort of little fracas inside the bank between the private bank and the investment bankers about who will actually produce the product. And I could mention two major banks whose names you would know that actually got to that stage, and then because of the current crisis, it all fell apart. Um, so I think the banks are interested and they understand the strategic issue. The, the, the point, to Jess' point, is that you've got to produce product that is easy, replicable, that are simple. And banks are sales organisations at the end of the day. And unless you can give it to a salesman, he can touch it, feel it, smell it, and punt it out the door. And the risk guys can just look at it and put their risk, standardised risk assessment. Then you're talking small, which is exactly what we do, small, individual, uh, contractually law structures with no economies of scale. And I come back to my previous point. It is the last thing a banker ever wants to see. It, it okay. Um, we have two questions lined up and only a few minutes left. We now have three. Any other questions? Four. Okay. So, team, nice and short and sweet. Tawny. Hi, Tony from Eco Capital. Um, I agree with you, Arthur, but I would argue that the private banks are really really far ahead. I mean, we structure for private banks and they are doing a lot of really innovative stuff, but that those products go straight into pockets that you don't see. I mean, there is no secondary market because they don't need one. Um, my question is really maybe looking 10, 15 years in the future, especially when it comes to um, debt instruments. What would you guys like to see? A repo market, um, an options market, and just on the social element of a bond um, I'd like just to get your thoughts 10, 15, 20 years in advance, what, what you'd like to see as, this, as the debt market actually develops. I'd like to see a market where the concept of impacting investment, impact investment is meaningless and that actually we've moved to a position of 3D investing where every investment and every product we make, we price in the externalities, we price in the impact on whatever that investment actually is. Big deal. I'm going to answer that on the basis of pain that I regularly go through. I regularly go in to speak to, to large multilateral organizations about a social finance issue. And what they give you an example on, on sanitation. And they summon in the doctors and, uh, and, and the engineers. And they talk about an idea like a contingent return model. And after about 35 minutes, they go, no, no, we can't do this. A contingent return model is, in essence, an option on a future. If I want to know how I do an option on a future, I go and ask a banker. This would be a bit, the, the flip side of this is that it would be me walking down to a City of London trading floor going, hi, guys, what do you think about Bangladeshi sewerage systems? I get exactly the same nonsensical reply as I do when I put a fi social finance issue into the, 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 the sectoral specialist. There's nothing wrong with sectoral specialists, but as a community, answer our, ourselves how we can address. We need to think about the innovation one or two cuts away and bring that expertise and leverage that expertise to the benefit of our community as opposed to asking the right questions to the wrong people. So to your, your question, I would like to start having conversations within the large organizations that recognize that this innovation that social entrepreneurs bring is one or two innovations away, and that they need to think how they integrate that in terms of what they're doing. Ross. Hi, uh, my name is Ross Baird. I run an organization called Village Capital, and we've been able to do some things in the UK, which is great. Um, I have a question. Arthur, your idea about the PRI 20% uh, is the most interesting idea I've heard all day. I have, I have no idea if it would work, but I, it, it's very interesting. Um, my question is, it, let's say that that passed, do you think that there would be enough demand in places to actually put that capital? You can guess I'm doing that thing where questioners ask questions where they're really making statements. Um, I don't think they would. Um, so either you can answer that in the affirmative, or if not, what are the most interesting things out there that are going to increase places to put investment capital besides social impact bonds? Uh, Program-related investment was passed by Congress in 1969. 
it represents currently about 2%. For those of you who don't know what program-related investment, it is where a foundation is allowed to use a for-profit capital tool for social purpose, as long as the primary purpose is social and not for profit. Uh, and that was confirmed, to your point, in February 2010, when the uh, American Bar Association tax section, I'll send you the letter, wrote to the IRS commissioner, confirming that um, the application of debt, equity, equity kickers, was applicable uh, for social investment. Uh, and in fact, this week, the IRS produced a new series of guidelines from private foundations confirming that layered structure. So there is law on the books uh, that defines the application of for-profit capital market tools for social purpose. Um, the stuff that I've worked in the United States, which is around something called the L3C, and we're doing it in the UK with the char former charity commissioner and, and the leading UK law, is about the application of applying a limited liability policy to that structure. And what that then allows you to do is to institutionalize the cross-subsidization between the charitable sector and the, uh, the for-profit sector with a social mission hardwired. Now, does it work? Does it happen? Yes. If you look at the affordable housing market, you will see those are exactly the types of structures that have moved billions of dollars. Uh, and furthermore, you can take a look at what the Congressional Budget Office research says that says that is revenue neutral to revenue positive. Uh, so all the L3C is, and the SELP in the UK, is taking that concept and applying that across ph uh, philanthropy more broadly. So to your question, yes, there is a code. Congress saw this back in 1969 in the United States. It isn't used at the moment because of the way it is structured. There is a legislation that's passed in 10 jurisdictions. A congressional bill was uh, tabled about uh, three, four weeks ago, three, four months ago, I apologize. Uh, so there are legal moves afoot to simplify that process. And okay. it is part of a process to get to producing vehicles that don't cost it. It is part of the mechanism to okay. produce securitization. We have three minutes and two questions, so the panel is going to have to be very, very tight. Hi, Evan Gill from the Aga Khan Foundation. Um, I'm not saying we have to wait this long, but I'm also going to go about 10, 15 years out into the future. Um, and I'm just wondering, to affect the kind of social change that you're all looking to do, what would be the one course that you would mandate every MBA student take? Psychedelic drugs? Oh, yeah, <laughs> they do already do it, apparently. Uh, yeah, the other question that was just down here. Um, could you pass that along, please? Thank you. Thank you. Anna Ritz from Next Billion. I was wondering, we were talking about the necessity to uh, have innovative products. We were talking about asking the right questions to the wrong people. What do you think, who are the um, key people in bringing forward those innovations, who must collaborate um, in which markets, in which sectors to bring these products into the market and into the awareness of the right people? Great, two brilliant questions to wrap up. Um, so I'm going to try and concertina this by saying, as your closing statement, <laughs> the one MBA course that you think everybody should take and the single person, apologies for concertina your question, the single person you think would make the substantive change our questioner asked. Uh, I'm going to answer the what I think is easier, which is the second question. You've got to do both, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, again, with my sort of um, public service innovation hat on, I think the single most important person in uh, the future of, of kind of innovation in public services is a commissioner who isn't who goes beyond being a procurer of services to uh, somebody who thinks about the overall system. So if you're thinking about um, uh, looked after children, uh, somebody who not only understands uh, what services they're buying now and they can buy now, but what the evidence for what works is and where there's a need for uh, innovation and therefore investment and thinks about that as a system rather than uh, a functional procurement job. A commissioner with binocular vision as per our earlier presenter. Um, and, and obviously, you need to do a social finance course as part of your MBA. Uh, I would do two things. Uh, to, the first, to the second question, because that is the easier one. Uh, I think this whole move towards outcome models. When you move away from bilateral negotiation in terms of solutions, to actually thinking in terms of tangible outcomes, and you are paying by those tangible outcomes, then you begin to create a mechanism for collaboration and scale. So the first point, to the first point, 
in terms of is changing the incentive structure. This is change management at the end. It's not about money, it's about change management. Uh, to the second question, I'm a history buff and I like history. I'd make everybody read Machiavelli, uh, 1528. Uh, and there's a quote by Machiavelli that said, there is nothing more difficult than trying to change uh, a system because all those that benefit out of the current system will basically protect their position. And those that would change or wish to create the change do not see the benefits from which drop from that innovation. I badly profess, but you get the point. So I, I would insist everybody reads the first management consultant, which is Niccolò Machiavelli, in my view. Excellent. Uh, second question. First, it would be uh, strong engagement by the, by the financial regulators that are, um, constrain our activity. And the first answer to the first question would be, don't go to MBA school. <laughs> Very good. Um, I should have gone first because you, you nicked the answer to yeah. Uh, I would I would echo that the regulator um, to enable um, this market to open up more quickly. Um, the first question I would actually reflect the the answer I made to Tony that I would instigate a course whereby people began to understand the true cost of everything they do and everything they do as a business and everything that they buy and everything that they invest in so that we actually start to correctly price the way we live and then people can start to think about how they actually therefore live and invest and do business. Big ideas. I'll be writing that next week then. Thank you very much, guys. Let's uh, give our panel a round of applause.